Hold on there. Hold on. I'll be with you in a minute. So you want to know about the ghost towns? The towns I used to live in? Good, good. Most folks nowadays don't believe in ghosts. All they believe in is facts. Give us facts, they say. My way of thinking, facts are all right, but they're poor, weak things with no power, no how, when it comes to getting men a movie. But dreams and hopes, ah, oh, those are the powerful things in men's lives. It was dreams that built the West. Fancy dreams, but strong and real in the hearts of the settlers that built the towns and the railroads of my day. These little old towns with their streets so full of hope and pride appeared while the fever of gold swept the nation. And when our dreams faded, then our towns died too. Now most of them just taken away by the wind. These pictures we have to show you were made years ago while some of the towns were still there to see. They're the best motion picture record ever made of the ghost towns of the Old West. Now you talk about gold towns, silver towns too. Well, they was never better than you could find up in the Rockies along the Great Divide and around Pikes Peak. They was rich towns back there then. Leadville. We called it a city in a sea of silver. And it was too. Leadville had the fanciest hotel I ever seen myself. Walnut beds all carved, silk sheets and the like. Fella had to be cleaned up real good to stay in a fancy place like that. Me, I was staying in a wagon behind the livery stable. Others were in tents, dugouts. This fella came to town once to give us a talk on interior decorating. Would you believe that? How to pick your wallpaper, and Persian rugs. We gave him a hell of an applause because he was entertaining. Well, you'll see. You'll see these old towns have got a lot of good stories. So you listen up. Up there in the Rockies, the dream of gold and riches brought 100,000 people to Central City, Colorado, 20,000 of them in just six weeks. Well, I recollect that was the site of the Gregory Lode. It was one of the richest strikes we ever made in that region. But poor old Gregory, that fella didn't know what he had found, and he sold his interest worth millions for only 20,000. Here's the story of the ghost towns of the Rockies. High in the mountainous peaks of Colorado lie some of the West's most famous ghost towns. This monument marks the site of the first great gold discovery in the Rocky Mountains. Few people today have ever heard of Gregory's digging, yet less than a hundred years ago it was on every tongue in America. Here, John Gregory, a Georgia prospector, tramped along in the midst of the towering peaks and stopped at the edge of a small stream. He knelt down near the water's edge and scooped up in his huge hands what he had traveled thousands of miles to find, gold. Word of the discovery spanned the continent and started a stampede unparalleled in history. Driven by the cry, 
There's gold in the Rocky Mountains. A hundred thousand people braved the dangers of starvation, thirst, freezing cold, and hostile Indians, and rushed into what was virtually unexplored territory. Only 15 white men lived in Central City when Gregory made the strike, but within a month, 6,000 had staked claims in the nearby streams. Six weeks later, there were 20,000 people in the camp. Overnight, the small settlement of lonely prospectors blossomed into the roaring mining towns of Gregory Gulch, Black Hawk, Idaho Springs, and Central City. Seat of the Golden Kingdom of Gilpin County, the richest square mile on earth. Here, houses, hotels, stores, and restaurants were hurriedly thrown up to provide shelter from the deadly mountain cold. But no amount of construction could keep pace with the onrush of the gold seekers as they rushed into the towns by every conceivable means of transportation. Every day, the stories of new strikes verified the fabulous wealth of the gold deposits. A professional hunter out looking for food fired a snap shot at a deer, and he missed. Deciding to trace the course of the bullet, he found that it had plowed a sparkling yellow crease in the hillside, uncovering a rich vein of gold. Mass starvation threatened the new cities, but excitement was at a fever pitch, and the pioneers were willing to gamble their very lives in the hope of finding a fortune. As the golden treasure flowed from the mines and placer diggings, the citizens of Central City became convinced that their town was destined to become the capital of Colorado and one of the world's great cities. A mark of its prosperity and hopes was the fine Teller House, most elegant of the frontier hotels. When President Grant visited Central City, he walked from his coach to the Teller House over a pavement of solid silver. However, the dignity of the welcoming ceremony was somewhat destroyed by some small boys who sat on the roof of a nearby stable and threw snowballs at President Grant's plug hat. No expense was spared to make the Teller House the most elaborately furnished hotel in the West. All of the massive furniture was brought overland from the East by ox cart. Each piece of furniture bore the hallmark of some famous craftsman who fashioned it by hand. In these palatial suites, the noted dignitaries who visited Central City were offered as many as 52 entrees, all prepared by a famous chef brought all the way from New York. Some of the most powerful and famous men of this era were guests in these very rooms. President Grant, General Sherman and Sheridan, Commodore Vanderbilt, Jay Gould, and Silver Dollar Tabor, who later rivaled the elegance of the Teller House with his own hotel in Leadville. The owner and builder of the hotel, Henry Teller, was another of the newly rich mining kings. A power in the territory's politics, he became one of the first United States senators from Colorado. It's interesting that one of the earliest guests of the town was the famous editor, Horace Greeley. And eager to impress their famous visitor, the miners salted a sandbar with gold dust. And Greeley was amazed at his so-called discovery. Unaware that he was tricked, he printed a glowing report in his Eastern newspaper, and new thousands flocked to the camp. The fine old Central City Opera House is still used as the scene of the annual music festival. The four-foot-thick granite blocks that form the walls were quarried in the nearby mountains 
and hauled to the building site by teams of 10 oxen. Maggie Mitchell, Edwin Booth, Sarah Bernhardt, and Joe Jefferson appeared in the musicals, grand opera, and dramatic plays that were presented. Over a hundred saloons were always open to serve the miners. Anything was available from French wines to a local drink known as Tayo's Lightning. Great quantities of this pison were sold, but it was wisely said that if you knew what was in it, you wouldn't drink it. Once a disastrous fire leveled Central City, but before the ashes had cooled, the city began to rebuild bigger and better than ever. Elaborate carvings and lacework on the houses became a fad, and the miners competed to outdo each other in decorating their homes with intricate design. Wood carvers and craftsmen were imported from the east to create the delicate wooden lace that still covers the outside of many of the homes. One of the first crude methods used to extract gold from the raw ore was the Spanish arrastra, or rock crusher. The ore was placed in the stone basin and the turning of the heavy mill wheel ground it into dust. Central City became the fashion capital of Colorado. The wives of the Bonanza Kings wore dresses imported from Paris, which were transported 700 miles from the Missouri River on a trip that took from four to eight weeks. For years, while the miners eagerly sought for gold, they cursed the black iron that fouled their stamping machine. It wasn't until the turn of the century that the black iron was recognized as tungsten, the vital hardening agent in steel. Many of the old mines have yielded far more from the cursed black iron than they ever did from the yellow gold. Along the steep face of Quartz Hill, near the outskirts of town, is the Great Glory Hole. Nearly a thousand feet long and 300 feet deep, this hole was once the site of numerous small mines. As the gold ore was blasted from the heart of the mountain, it was carried by air rail tram over what was then the world's longest cable to the stamping mills on the other side of the mountain. Millions of dollars in gold have been taken from the Glory Hole, one of the few open-pit gold mines in the world. In 1872, the tracks of the Central City Railway finally reached this old depot, and Gilpin County was connected to the transcontinental rail line. This engine maintained a regular schedule for over 70 years. It wasn't until 1941 that service was discontinued and the last fire was banked in the old boiler. Central City and California Gulch were cradles of much of the mining law of the West. The rules were simple and the punishment severe. For the miners were more concerned with justice than legal procedure. The size of mining claims was rigidly defined. No one, except the original discoverer, could hold more than one creek, gulch, or mountain claim. A claim had to be worked within 10 days to establish ownership, and miners' courts settled all disputes, but no one could employ a lawyer unless his opponent happened to have one. In spite of these laws, there was constant warfare between the mine owners and claim jumpers. Possession was nine-tenths of the law, and a man defended his property himself, with more cases being settled by Winchesters than by courts. Near the outskirts of Central City, is the old settlement of Russell Gulch. The town and gulch were named after Green Russell, who led a party here in 1859. For a time, this discovery rivaled Central City, and $500,000 a week was taken from its streams. The camp was nearly abandoned in 1862, when Russell, a southerner, left to join the Confederate Army. The steady stream of gold from these mines maintained the struggling territory of Colorado in its infancy and caused the migration that eventually made it a great state. $125 million was taken before the rich loads and placers were exhausted. The yellowed records from the Black Hawk City Hall are constant reminders of the important part these towns played 
in shaping the American frontier. This old church, which once tended the spiritual needs of the fickle miners and their families, was deserted as quickly as they abandoned the mines when the gold gave out. But they left behind these monuments of a forgotten era, the birthplace of the Rocky Mountain Empire, seat of the Golden Kingdom of Gilpin County, the ghost towns of the Rockies. The Great Divide runs north and south through the Rockies, right here. Here's where the gold rush began in California Gulch, Colorado. When this miner passing through here found gold in a stream bed just waiting to be panned out. Then later on in Leadville, after the gold ran out, silver was discovered and the mining continued for a real long spell. This here is the story of the ghost towns of the Great Divide. High atop Lookout Mountain, in the remote vastness of the Colorado Rockies, is the grave of William Frederick Cody, more affectionately known as Buffalo Bill. Along with Jim Bridges and Wild Bill Hickok, Bill Cody will long be remembered as one of the great Indian scouts and trail breakers who played such an important role in pushing civilization to the West. In 1860, he was one of the riders of the famed Pony Express. And later, he kept the laborers supplied with buffalo meat as they toiled to span the continent with its first railroad. Along the rocky rim which guards his grave stand other monuments of westward expansion and progress. Not headstones or grave markers, but crumbling walls and abandoned homes. These are the ghost towns of the Great Divide. These cattle now graze on a field that once saw a surging tide of humanity roll westward, sweeping from the border towns of the Missouri River and along the Overland and Santa Fe trails, excited fortune seekers by the tens of thousands drove on toward the gold fields of Kansas, as the Great Divide country was then known. Each was certain his pick and shovel would uncover a golden fortune. California Gulch was one of the first great gold strikes in the Rocky Mountains. In three months, the population increased from eight men and an Indian squaw to over 5,000. Here it was Abe Lee stopped by a stream on his way to California. He casually dipped his new gold pan into some gravel then leaped to his feet and shouted, boys, I got California at the bottom of my pan. Gold was so plentiful in these streams that the only mining machinery required was a crude sluice box and a shovel. The gravel from the creek bed was shoveled into the sluice. The gold, being heavier, remained at the bottom while the gravel washed out. Other prospectors merely used the panning method in the very shallow streams. If a gold pan was not available, a wash basin or a pie tin was pressed into service. Nuggets of almost pure gold were recovered and it was not uncommon for a man to wash out as many as a thousand dollars in a day. After the surface gold gave out, the prospectors tore into the granite walls of the mountains to follow the gold veins. Crude stamping machines were set up, some powered by steam and others by water to break up the ore. Square set timbering was employed to keep the roof and the sides from caving in. Today, the square set timbering method is still in use. Although the mines have been completely electrified and the ore is brought to the surface in trains of motor-driven cars.
Of course, the ore today is not nearly so rich in mineral content as it was when the surface mines were in operation. Thus, the tons of ore in these cars sometimes totaled no more in gold or silver than did a few shovels full dug by the miners of yesterday. For nearly 20 years, the settlement was a ghost town, surrounded only by broken mines and mounds of red sand discarded during the gold mining. Then, Uncle Billy Stevens, a Minnesota mining engineer, discovered that the red sands were virtually pure carbonate of lead with an amazingly high silver content. The camp burst into new life. 30,000 people streamed up the twisting mountain road to the city, which was renamed Leadville in honor of the new discovery. The richness of these new deposits was unbelievable. Leadville was a city in a sea of silver. The ore here was so valuable, a miner offered the owner $10,000 for permission to work for one hour in an area only four feet square. The offer was refused. The rich ore was everywhere. An old prospector died, and his friends hired a sexton to dig him a grave. A few days later, they discovered he was still unburied. While digging the grave, the sexton discovered a silver vein and had staked out the cemetery as a mining claim. In three years, the population of Leadville was estimated at 40,000 and it was called the Magic City. Mines, even shallow holes, were sold and resold many times in a single day and always at a profit. Real estate prices skyrocketed and business lots along Chestnut Street sold at $250 a foot, while stores rented for $1,000 a month. To keep pace with the building boom, Leadville imported carpenters and masons from eastern cities, paying premiums as high as $50 a day for their services. By the end of 1880, Leadville had 28 miles of streets paved with the slag from its smelters. The pastor of this church asked for the donation of a piano. When the next wagon train was unloaded, 18 of these square pianos were delivered to the church. In 1878, August Meyer built this fine old house. Now known as the Healy House, it was an early show place of Leadville. Many of the great and distinguished men of the period were honored at the lavish parties given here during the boom years. Furnishings such as this chandelier were brought from New York and Boston and packed into the mining camps in great freight wagons. A fierce rivalry existed among the mine owners who were called the Carbonate Kings, each trying to furnish his home in more splendor and opulence than the others. Imported pieces were in great demand and the wealthy miners toured Europe in search of antiques and old masterpieces. Porcelain, paintings, and statues often shared the same conestote wagons on the hazardous trip from the Missouri River. 700 miles away, as did such household necessities as sugar, flour, calico, and coffee. Although this house has been in ruins for years, it was once the most magnificent and richly furnished in all Colorado. For it was the home of the greatest carbonate king of them all, Horace Austin Tabor, known round the world as Silver Dollar. As his wealth increased, Tabor donated an opera house so Leadville could match Denver and the other great cities in culture. No expense was spared in making Tabor's Opera House the showplace of the Great Divide. Its fame spread like wildfire, and men came from miles around to see the shows presented here. Here it was, the great Oscar Wilde gave a lecture on interior decorating 
while Lotta Crabtree, the miner's favorite, puffed on her big black cigar as she waited in the wings for her turn to appear in a Shakespearean play. The Tabor Grand Hotel, now known as the Vendome, was the finest in the Rockies. More than a hundred wagons were used between St. Louis and Leadville to supply the furnishings for these spacious rooms. French cabinet makers were retained to repair any damage to the valuable pieces due to their overland journey. Beds made of richly burled walnut sported hand-woven silk sheets. The drapes and curtains on the windows were also hand-woven in Damascus and Ceylon. In Tabor's private suite, every piece of furniture was finished in pure gold leaf at a cost of thousands of dollars. He even boasted that he had personally designed it, the furniture and supervised all the interior decorating in his own apartment. Silver Dollar's most prized possession was the matchless mine. One single shipment from the matchless contained 10,000 ounces of silver in each ton of ore. With an annual income that exceeded $5 million, Tabor spent money as though the United States Mint was his personal possession. When his wife, Augusta, failed to show an appetite for their new life of splendor, Tabor divorced her and married a beautiful woman known as Baby Doe. But suddenly fortune seemed to turn against him. Congress removed the support prices from silver and the mining camps collapsed. Even the matchless failed him when the great silver vein was lost. The greatest of the carbonate kings died in a boarding house, destitute and forgotten. His sole possession was the now barren matchless, but he had faith and his last words to Baby Doe were, hold on to the matchless. And Baby Doe did just that. She went to live in this shack near the mine. Here the carbonate queen lived out her days. Hands that were once covered with diamonds now held a pick as she worked deep in the mine, endlessly seeking the lost vein. The passing of Baby Doe marked the end of an era in Leadville. Justly called the Magic City, Leadville helped open a new frontier to civilization. It was more than a mining camp. It was a mineral camp. It was a mineral empire. Leadville, the city in a sea of silver. Just like the Rockies and the Great Divide, the Dakotas spawned their share of the gold towns. But up here, we had a special problem. Them Sioux Indians weren't too happy when us miners and settlers showed up. You can't blame them either. They'd fought the other Indian tribes for this land, and they aimed to keep it too. So right here now, we're going to have the story of the gold rush in the Dakotas. But hardly a stone's throw from this serene memorial to these men are ghost towns that remind us of the Dakotas' bloody past. Let us turn back the pages of time and find out how they came into being and how they died. Fossils found near here prove that this once was the scene of savage battles between saber-toothed tigers, wild three-toed horses, giant pigs, great lizards, and enormous crocodiles. But just as the prehistoric beasts gave way to these more modern animals, so did the prehistoric man make way for his descendants. First came the mound builders, next the peaceful Re Indians, and then the warlike Sioux who drove out the reeds. But the Sioux were not long to enjoy these rich hunting lands, for the white man had discovered that the Dakotas were teeming with fur-bearing animals. The Indians battled the invaders, but they didn't become a serious threat until they discarded their tomahawks in favor of guns, traded to them by profiteers like the notorious Jesse James, who lived in this desolate shack. Disaster was averted by a treaty signed in 1868 which set aside certain lands for the red man. Part of the reservation included the Black Hills. The Black Hills, where gold was discovered a few years after the treaty had been made. Among the first of the gold seekers were those in an expedition led by a man named Gordon. Gordon and his party 
erected this stockade when they'd reached the Dakotas after a three-month journey across a trackless snowbound prairie. The hooves of their oxen had been wrapped in burlap so they could complete the grueling trek, and the men were also near exhaustion. Yet, the buildings they fashioned were built with patient hands and careful attention to construction detail. Gordon's expedition consisted of six covered wagons, 26 stalwart men, one small boy and his mother, Annie D. Talent, first white woman to set foot in the Dakotas. Mindful of the Laramie Treaty with the Indians, however, the government had the newcomers arrested and sent home. But now, thousands of white men began pouring into the district and nothing could stop them. They had guns. They also had strategically located gun ports through which they could shoot marauding Indian braves, and they had courage. This was a land of opportunity, of gold, and they wouldn't give it up. Native stone and wood were used to build the mines, and the Black Hill country rang with the song of the axe. Mines soon dotted the countryside, and although some of them proved almost worthless, rich strikes were made at the Golden Reward Mine at the Homestake Mine, and at countless other locations. The West's first gold seekers had waded into icy streams with pans, some of them still warm from the cook stoves. Later, the more productive sluice boxes had been built, but now the dawn of the machine age had arrived, and man had learned how to grow rich easier and faster. Nothing could stop the flow of people looking for gold not the Sioux Nation or the U.S. Army, but they both tried. The rush to Pikes Peak here in Colorado was a start of great disappointment and hardship for tens of thousands of folks following the dream of gold. The rush was started by a newspaper in Kansas City. They was calling it a new El Dorado. But the gold in this region came instead from places like Cripple Creek, Elkhorn, Victor, and Anaconda, the toughest town of them all. These are the ghost towns of Pikes Peak. No relics so completely symbolize Colorado's glamorous past as the ghost towns of Pikes Peak, the old mining camps tucked away in the rock-ribbed valleys of the Great Divide. This region under the shadow of Pikes Peak was long described as worthless, but a part-time prospector named Bob Womack was obsessed with the peculiar idea that there was gold somewhere in this cow pasture. Womack was called Crazy Bob when he built this cabin and set out to search the steep slopes. Crazy Bob dug so many holes in the side of the mountain, people said, if you want to find Womack, just follow his holes. He'll be in the last one. Finally, many years later in Poverty Gulch, he struck it rich with his discovery of the famous Gold King Mine. Specimen ore from the load ran $140 to the ton. And to celebrate his luck, Womack went on a roaring drunk in the temperance town of Colorado Springs. Before he sobered up, Womack had sold the Gold King for $500. Eventually, the deep shaft of the mine produced over $6 million making Womax the most expensive spree in history. Around the site of the Gold King, the town of Cripple Creek burst into existence. Named for a forgotten cowboy who broke his arm while chasing steers through the canyons, Cripple Creek was the last great gold strike in the United States. Two months after the rush started, a population of 5,000 men and seven women sprang up in what was called the Million Dollar Cow Pasture. Buildings were thrown together to provide shelter from the mountain cold, and 50 to 75 miners would crowd together in one of these buildings, often paying $5 apiece for sleeping space on the floor. Pikes Peak or Bust became the battle cry, and the words Crippled Creek and Gold soon became just as famous.
A vacationing school teacher staked a pile of rocks on which he found a pair of elk horns. He gave a half interest in the Elkton to two grocers in settlement of a $30 bill. All three became wealthy when a $13 million vein was discovered under the old elk horn. The old stores made fortunes selling mining equipment at fantastic prices to the new wave of gold-mad tenderfeet who stormed into the basin. Everyone expected to become rich overnight, and gold was everywhere. Jones and Miller, two druggists, hurried in from Colorado Springs. All the land looked alike to them, so Jones threw up his hat, saying, we'll dig where it lands. They staked the claim and named their mine the pharmacist. The druggists recovered over a million dollars each from the pharmacist's mine. The Crescent Duke, thought to be worthless by its owners, was unloaded on a group of Iowa farmers. The farmers hired a brilliant young mining engineer named Roloffs to sink a shaft. At 1,200 feet, the famous Crescent Vug was discovered, a pocket of gold in its purest natural form. The strike was so valuable, a bank door of solid steel was put on the mouth of the shaft. At its peak, Cripple Creek became a teeming city of over 50,000 people, all dependent on the treasure that poured from the 5,000 mines dotting the old cow pasture. Life in the camp was hectic and dangerous, especially on Saturday night. Shooting scrapes were so common, an enterprising undertaker offered cut rates for funerals, providing the killings occurred on Saturday night. But Sunday brought a comparative lull to the camp. Miners and their wives promenaded down the avenues. The women dressed in the latest Paris fashions, while the men wore the frock coats of the period. By far the most famous of Cripple Creek's Bonanza Kings was Winfield Scott Stratton, whose daughter, Jean Stratton Porter, became a world-famous novelist. Unlike many of the, the new millionaires, Stratton stayed in Crippled Creek and built his home where he could look out over his great mines. Stratton had struggled for years as a carpenter and part-time prospector before making his great strike on the 4th of July, 1891. In honor of the day, he named his mine the Independence. From the Independence came the gold for Stratton's many generosities and eccentricities. On one occasion, he bought a bicycle for every waitress and laundry girl in Colorado Springs so they could ride to work. Fire, the great enemy of the mining camps, never ravaged the basin. When the alarm rang out, matched white horses pulling the engine galloped from the fire station to battle the roaring flames. The basin proudly boasted three railroads. On one, Florence and Cripple Creek business was so profitable it paid for itself in the first seven months. A young Negro named Jack Johnson, who later gained fame as the heavyweight champion of the world, worked as a porter in this depot. These old houses on the outskirts of town were the homes of the more respectable element of Cripple Creek, the family men, small mine owners and mine superintendents who brought their wives and children to the basin. Across town, the wild and woolly element made their headquarters at the Mozart Saloon. Here, a young miner fought a bloody battle for a $50 purse and gave great promise as a young heavyweight. His name was Bob Fitzsimmons. Gentleman Jim Corbett and Jim Jeffries also gave exhibitions in the old gymnasium. Cripple Creek's chief rival in the basin was the town of Victor, the scene of some fabulous strikes. Rich mines like the Molly Kathleen, the COD, Hiawatha, and Red Umbrella were the important strikes of this district. It could truly be said that the streets of Victor were paved with gold, for low-grade ore was used as the paving material. Once, when the streets were torn up to supply new sewers for the business district, Old-timers panned $5,000 from the pavement in one block. 
the gold coin mine in the center of town, one of the richest surface mines in the district, was discovered while some Easterners were excavating for a hotel basement. The idea of a hotel was quickly abandoned, and the cellar was deepened to become the shaft of the mine. The brokerage houses of Victor handled much of the speculation in mining stocks. The mighty Portland mine of Victor, the richest mine in the entire basin, and probably one of the richest gold strikes in the entire world, was discovered on a claim only 70 feet long by 40 feet wide. This small plot, less than the size of the average city lot, was the center of an incredible deposit of $65 million in bright and shining gold. The ore cages dipped deep into the side of the mountain to bring out the treasure, each cartload adding to the fabulous fortune of the two Irish teamsters who staked the Portland. The peaceful city hall at Victor once served as a fortress during the savage labor wars that tore the basin. These clashes between the mine owners and strikers often reached the scale of small wars with hundreds of armed men on either side. Federal troops placed cannon and gatling guns in the streets to maintain order. Near Bull Hill Station is the site of the fort built by the strikers. Under the shadow of Pikes Peak is the $12 million Isabella mine, scene of a phenomenal strike of metallic gold. One small shipment of raw ore sold for $219,000, and every shovel full of the ore was worth between three and $400, a record never equaled in mining history. Only one remaining house marks the site of the town of Altman. Once a thriving community of 3,000, Altman was built at an elevation of over two miles above sea level and was proudly claimed to be the highest incorporated town in the United States. Most of the mines of the basin have now been exhausted, and with the death of the mines, the towns have been abandoned. Only a few dozen ramshackle frame buildings remain in Goldfield, once the shipping hub of the basin. Over $300 million worth of bullion was shipped from the Goldfield depots at the height of the boom. Fittingly enough, the jail is the best preserved structure in Anaconda, once the toughest town in the basin, the scene of many gun battles and riots, and proud of its reputation. Anaconda was a town of small miners who fought hard for their gold. Gone with the great strikes, the bonanzas and El Dorados, is the romance of the early boom days. Great corporations employing the most modern methods have replaced the prospector. Men can no longer dream of achieving the fortunes made by the early millionaires. To the younger generation, the work is merely a job. To their fathers, it was high adventure, holding a promise of wealth and independence. The great strikes have gone the way of history vanishing with the open frontier. But they have left behind the stories of carpenters and school teachers, teamsters and cowboys, who by sheer courage and determination defeated the mountains and won a half billion dollars in bright and shining gold. The story of their lives is the story of Cripple Creek Basin, the richest square mile in history, the greatest gold camp on earth. We come to the West, our heads all full of dreams of gold and silver. Dreams so big that I could hardly get my hat on. No comments needed from you, dog. Sometimes we found our gold, most times we didn't. But we lived the great adventure of the old West, all of us. We come and we went. And them little towns we built, they come and went too. The dream towns, I call them. The ghost towns of the old west. And now, we too are gonna be on our way. 
You coming, dog? Don't forget about your dreams, and don't be scared to take a chance. Cause then, well, just maybe, maybe you'll be the one to strike it rich. All you have to do is dig.